Good morning. Welcome to the Telecom Exchange CEO Roundtables, both for our guests here at Telecom Exchange NYC and for our viewers joining us on RCR TV and JSA TV. Our second panel today is on network security, both in 2017 and beyond. And we're very honored to have my friend, Evan Christel, social media business strategist and advisor for ucstrategies.com, but really the number one social media influencer in our industry. Uh, so it's truly uh, in, and I'm not just saying it, there's actually folks who survey these things and, and tell us as well. Uh, so it is our honor. He brings 20 plus years of sales, alliances, and biz dev experience in the communications and infrastructure applications. Uh, and if you're like me, you're one of his over 126,000 Twitter followers of Evans, if, uh, if uh, last count is, uh, is uh, right. He's probably grown that since, uh, since I checked it a couple of days ago. He's a top Twitter and LinkedIn influencer in our space. And if you're also like me, you're retweeting all of his amazing research and social content, particularly on network security, which makes him a perfect moderator for our esteemed panelists. So please go ahead and welcome social influencer, my friend, Mr. Evan Christel. Wow, what an introduction. Uh, I've never been introduced that way before. That's awesome. Thank you. You know, when I tell people what I do for a living as a social media influencer, I get very strange and quizzical looks. And so it, it, it requires some clarification maybe afterwards exactly what I do. But um, I was once called the George Takai of the telecom world. So I wasn't sure if that was uh, an insult or a compliment, but I'll take it. Whatever, whatever, whatever. a little, little odd maybe, but interesting nonetheless, I hope. Um, so today's panel, a really, uh, really esteemed group of individuals and really timely because security and cybersecurity of top of mind uh, as individuals, as consumers, as business people. And there isn't a day that goes by that there isn't, you know, a top of the fold headline around a data breach or a DDoS attack or some other cybersecurity uh, incident. It's permeated every aspect of our life, including things like politics now. So. This panel is, is, is really a high profile uh, and an excellent group of individuals to talk about, you know, a few points of view uh, in the industry. So we'll start uh, on my left. Um, it'd be great to introduce yourself, but I'd like to understand what keeps you up at night in terms of a, a professional in this space around cybersecurity and security topics. You know, what are you worried about? Uh, what do you fear the most? And if we could start um, maybe with a brief introduction and, uh, and go from there. Sure. Hi. Um, I'm Najar Ahmad. I'm part of the network team at Facebook. Um, essentially, we worry about uh, the production network that uh, Facebook runs to support Facebook, WhatsApp, Instagram, Oculus, things like that. Uh, there's a number of services under that. Um, and also focus on a little bit of the uh, more on the R&D side of building technologies to, to uh, have broadband widely available across the globe as well. So there's a lot of work we're doing on the access side um, for technology development. Um, in terms of what keeps me up at night, it's kind of interesting that we're on the security panel. Um, the I'll give you a quick short story. A long time ago, we did a red team exercise. We invited a bunch of people to try to hack in. Um, and the key takeaway um, out of that uh, for me was, you're never secure. You're always only a little far or further away from being hacked. So it's something that, that is really unnerving that you'll never be done uh, in terms of feeling secure. And you just need to make sure that we're continuing to invest in security infrastructure, security technologies, especially detection and mitigation. Um, you have to constantly invest in it. You'll never feel secure. So that's a really unnerving feeling for somebody who runs an infrastructure uh, for a site like Facebook, which has a lot of data. Um, you just never feel like you're done. Great. That was that was really interesting. Leo, thank you. Um, so I'm Leo Tadio on the CISO for Sixterra. Uh, previous to uh, my role at Sixteria, I was the special agent in charge of the FBI's New York Cyber Division. Uh, so I got to see the adversary from a couple of perspectives. So if you ask what uh, keeps me up at night is uh, building a security program 
that's focused on yesterday's vulnerabilities and yesterday's adversaries, uh, it's very hard to anticipate what the next generation of attacks is going to look like and what our infrastructure uh, will do when attacked. Uh, so we spend a lot of money fighting the last war, and um, I wonder sometimes if it's totally wasted. And I'll give you an example. Um, when you look at the Sony breach of 2014, the um, Sony Pictures Entertainment was focused on protecting motion pictures that had not yet been distributed, and they thought those were their crown jewels, and that's where the potential risk was. And what they failed to realize was that the real risk to the company was in the information in some sensitive emails. Um, so you could, uh, from Sony's point of view, make another movie uh, and recover the losses if you lost the movie, but what you couldn't do very easily was recover relationships, for example, with the artists that make the movies. So. Um, the attackers in that case understood better than the defenders what was really of value and uh, Sony for all it spent on security because if you remember they were breached in 2011 and for many times in between those breaches uh, so they had a, a very expensive and robust security uh, apparatus but they were defending uh, against the adversary and uh, a, with a perspective that was out of date so that's my fear is that we don't truly understand what's coming thanks that was very helpful uh, George, as a telco, you have a 24-7 service expectation, so I know Absolutely. what keeps you up at night, but in particular <laughs> relative to cyber security, cyber attacks on infrastructure, what, what are you most worried okay. about? Okay, well, first of all, um, just to introduce myself, I'm uh, the CTO at YRIE, and our company is a wholesale network operator, and we focus on underserved markets, so we extend uh, private secure networks into, um, into remote markets um, for our carrier uh, customers. Um, and what keeps me up at night you know, with our own internal networks really is, um, is the, the people and um, the psychology of our people, our employees. Uh, we can put all kinds of technology detection and prevention to, uh, to try and block um, these intrusions from coming into our network, but at the end of the day, people are people and they're gonna get tricked into clicking on a link or, uh, you know, posting something on a social media site that's, uh, that can be used uh, to penetrate a, a network. Yeah, social media is now the new uh, battle zone for cybersecurity. Uh, Laurent, uh, maybe an introduction and also what not only worries you, but also your customers who are yeah. uh, working with you in a collaborative way. Yeah, thank you. Very happy to be here. So my name is Laurent. I'm one of the founders of Zenedge. So we are a cybersecurity company. We provide protection against networks and applications. Here's the problem I have when you ask me this question is what keeps me up at night is never the same thing. Um, and that's, I think, uh, Leo said it very well, and you, you did as well, um, is as a vendor, as a provider of cybersecurity solution, we have to play one step ahead. And it's really hard to play one step ahead when you are still trying to catch up on many subjects. So I'll just give you an example. We, um, we see a lot of attacks happening these days on APIs. Um, and API is probably, or API security is probably one of the least well, well understood and well protected way uh, communication between machine to machine, but it's also communication between your phone uh, on your application and the backend server of the application you're trying to access to. Um, and we see a lot of um, very disturbing activities on, uh, on the traffic on APIs or, or in general between um, bot versus human traffic. And, and we see a lot of different uh, examples of this, and I'm just, I mean, we see bots that behave like humans. They're really hard to catch because they really look like a person behind the screen or behind the app, but in fact, it's a machine you're fighting against. And then we also see humans like, that behave like bots. And that's a nightmare because if you have a very solid bot protection, you're able to identify, hey, this is not a real person because of this behavior, but it happened to be, it's a real person, uh, usually sitting in an emerging country that, you know, from nine to five that is going to a site and copy data and then try to sell this data to someone else. So uh, bot management, um, identifying bot with behaviors is very hard to do. And it's even harder when there is no real um, um, expected uh, person behind the screen when you're talking of API security or machine to machine. And we have a lot of examples on this, but this is really what um, we see right now as uh, something that is a bit scary. Application protection is well understood. Um, there are a lot of uh, providers that know how to prevent data breaches on applications. API security is much harder to do it. 
Thanks, that was helpful. I'd love to come back and talk about some specific examples. I've heard some terrifying ones from your team around attacks that are uh, directed towards things like e-commerce sites and airlines that are very uh, specifically focused on disrupting revenue. Yeah, so we have one case, um, and it's a customer, it's an airline. Um, and this is what happened to this customer. So they have um, about 1% of their revenue come from China. Um, they are in Southeast Asia. Uh, but 60% of their cancellation come from China. And so this is really weird, right? Uh, so 60% of canceling a ticket is Chinese-based, and 1% one one of China is their revenue. Something is wrong. And so we looked at it, and we looked at the behavior of these users. And we find out 24 hours a day, these are people, we think, um, going to a site, booking a plane ticket, waiting 24 hours, and canceling it. So what happened is, well, the plane gets full, as bots are booking the tickets. So the remaining seats are expensive because that's how yield management works for airline. And therefore, during this time, the low-cost airline, the competition, is selling tickets like crazy because they are cheaper. Right? So security is not always about, hey, I'm going to steal your information. I'm going to steal your credit cards and numbers and your uh, healthcare records. It's also about uh, hurting your business by inappropriate use of a website. But we want people to buy tickets, right? So how do you how do you make sure that hey no this is not a real one? So we we uh, we look at the behavior. We could catch we could catch them. Um, they are all from Shenzhen. It's uh, outside of Hong Kong. It's in mainland China. Uh, it's a few IP address. We know who they are. Uh, they know that we know who they are because they can't buy tickets anymore. <laughs> uh, and uh, <laughs> it's a game. Uh, obviously, this is a group that was uh, hired by we think some competition. Uh, they, you know, they don't make money themselves, they make money by the consulting that they provide or the service they provide to buy tickets. And we could catch them because of their unusual way of behavior. These are same same person or same entity that is doing repeated, repeated tasks all day long, changing IPs, changing everything all the time, but still repetitive, and that's how we could catch them. And uh, sorry guys, you can't buy tickets anymore if you're yeah, in China. It's, it's, it's funny you describe it as a game, a game that's not so funny. So uh, sp you know, speaking of which, uh, Najam, and Facebook, obviously the most, the biggest social network in the world, you must be an extraordinary target of attacks. Um, how has the evolution of these ta attacks taken place and the sophistication and the nature of the attacks? What, what have you seen uh, from your perspective? Well, one interesting fact, we're under attack right now. So we're attacked uh, about 100% of the time. Uh, something is going on. Um, the, um, it's essentially you see the attacks on several different fronts, and, and it's not one specific thing. Um, I think the attack on the network infrastructure itself is actually have diminished, and I think it's uh, not big returns for people. Uh, but it really depends on which actors you're, you're dealing with, and we essentially see all of them. There's some that are just trying to prove something to get in. Uh, the others are trying to take over some machines or trying to get to data, or the other, some are really trying to um, cause other infrastructure or denial of service type environment. So we see essentially the whole gamut of things. Um, and as you said, the infrastructure ones are the sort of relatively easy ones because those scenarios are relatively well understood uh, and good defenses against that. Uh, it's the, the things that Laurent was talking about uh, looking at the broader set of information that um, we have as, as an infrastructure, everything from APIs down to the network device that's carrying those bits and having the ability to have detection across. Um, and it's kind of, I think it's going to lead into more of a how we think about those things because um, one of the fundamental things that we have been trying to change is instead of uh, the security being implemented via a platform or a device, we're really looking at security as a collection of a lot of data and a lot of analytics that we can do on top, and we're essentially looking for patterns. Um, so when I say a lot of data, it's essentially picking data uh, from any platform and any service and any anything that we build, uh, from APIs to hardware that we deploy on the network side or the servers, things like that. So getting the entire stack of network and systems involved and have that data set available. Uh, and then be able to do a lot of uh, compute on it to detect patterns. So this is 
the advantage that we do have is, that, you know, we have a lot of software engineers as well, so we can actually have machine learning type people work on building um, an, an analysis of what we're actually seeing and pick out the little patterns. And the hardest ones are the one or two trickle that come in, somebody that does a brute force attack that's sort of usually easy. But the one or two or three things that happen quietly, those are the ones that we need to kind of pick out. Uh, and it could be at any different, any level. And that sort of kind of leads into how security is implemented and, and mm -hmm. how we think about security. Interesting. Uh, so, so Leo, you know, we've heard the scale and the velocity of attacks are increasing. What about sophistication back from when you were in the FBI through the present day? What, what have you noticed about the, the sophistication of the attacks and even the, the attackers, perhaps? Yeah, there's no doubt that um, sophistication at every level is increasing. So down from the hobby, hab, uh, hobby hacker all the way to the nation state, it's certainly an increase in sophistication. And what we've seen um, even just recently with WannaCry and others is um, the adoption of what were nation state tools to criminal purposes or perhaps nation state purposes, which um, is possible in that case. So there, there is a proliferation of tools and talent that um, is exploding. We have uh, organizations today that are investing in research and development for their hacking um, talent. They are uh, farming within criminal communities to uh, find talent. So I'll give you an example. Recently in the Yahoo breach, there was an indictment uh, that accused uh, two Russian intelligence officers of aiding uh, criminal hackers in, in two, two areas, according to the indictment. One is in enriching themselves in a criminal sense um, with a scheme to enrich themselves. The other was using the hackers to advance uh, legitimate, well, authorized regime sanctioned uh, hacking activity. Uh, and so when you can meld the capabilities of a nation state with the criminal groups, um, you, you naturally will have an advance in the capabilities of the criminal groups. And it's a vicious cycle that uh, is to the detriment of defenders. So I think the bottom line for us is we are no longer um, facing a spectrum of attackers. We're pretty much focused on the high end of sophistication and capability at all times. And that's because criminal groups have adopted nation state tools and techniques, and nation states have masked them, their own activity behind uh, criminal group identities. And that's been borne out in a number of cases. So what does it mean for defenders? It means for defenders that um, we used to take a, a risk-based approach where we uh, looked at our adversaries, tried to determine the motives, tried to determine what they were after, and spent our money uh, wisely, meaning you spent more money on the things that were important <coughs> and against the most sophisticated adversaries. But today, most, most adversaries are sophisticated and most resources are very valuable. There's very little information that's not valuable. Uh, so it's very hard to take a risk-based approach to cyber defense. Everything's important, and everybody's after it, and they all have the best tools. So it's just bad news all around. It's almost um, throw your hands up and say, what do we do next? But I think there are some uh, ways for us to catch up, and um, one of the most important, I think, is in, in how we design and implement our infrastructure, and having secure infrastructure is really the key, and having consolidation of tools and not having to manage tools or manage vendors and reducing the complexity of those tools is really the future of security and we have to start moving in that direction and that's where I think our investments need to be. Yeah, it's exciting and it, it's funny that technology may be our savior in the form of machine learning and artificial intelligence in the end, uh, but we have a long way to go. Um, George, what about you from the telco perspective? I mean, when I used to worry about security, it was mainly DDoS attacks, and now we're seeing the intensity of those up by an order of magnitude. But, you know, what else is on your mind in terms of uh, threats to your infrastructure? Well, what we're seeing from, from our customers really is uh, almost a movement back to private networks. You know, we're all talking about the Internet and opening up the Internet. Um, but, you know, if you have mission-critical operations and sensitive data like government and financial, um, you know, unless you're really comfortable that that data is going to be protected, you know, there, there's really, we're seeing a push back for private. Um, and private, um, you know, can come in different flavors. When we talk about private, um, we're talking about traffic that does not pass over the internet at all. We have some customers actually that put it in their contracts that their traffic shall not pass through the internet. Not even our management traffic as a network operator, we can't connect to our remote locations through, uh, through the internet. Um, so that, you know, that's, that's a challenge, definitely. Um, 
then when we're, all, we're talking about access to um, the network, access to the physical sites, there's a whole another layer that you need to put on when you're, when you're dealing with, with security. It's not just uh, access to the data. It's, you know, who's actually going to be touching that data? Who's going to be touching that box? Who's going to go into that government office to, uh, to put in a router? Um, so there's a whole layer of, of uh, security in terms of clearances. What kind of back checks do you need to do on the employees? And how do you maintain, um, you know, that it's current? that you're not sending somebody in there that has a criminal background or, you know, they even do credit checks for some that are dealing with uh, financial uh, institutions because if you are, you know, if you're in financial difficulty, you may be more tempted to, uh, uh, to skim a little bit uh, into your pocket. So that's what we're seeing in terms of, of private, um, you know, private networks. And, you know, you can't go private everywhere, but, you know, some of these mission critical uh, operations that, you uh, need to make sure that there's not going to be a, a security breach or willing to pay a little bit extra to get that, uh, that level of security. Yeah, sort of back to the future. Laurent, you must see a lot in terms of all the customers you work with. You know, what, what's, the, what's your view of this, your customers in terms of how they're being threatened and attacked and this new la level of sophistication? So um, we see this private network uh, uh, quite often, in fact, especially financial institutions. Uh, stock exchanges is a good example. Um, uh, universities as well uh, have private networks that connect universities to each other. The problem here is, uh, in the education side at least, is well, the attack comes from within. So it's a private network that actually contains the attack into the private network, but they're actually act attacking another participant that belongs to the same uh, private network. So we've seen this one a few times. Um, the the um, uh, One of the... Um, I think defense that we see works quite quite well, or at least um, the area of research we're spending a lot of time on, is machine-to-machine uh, -machine protection uh, using artificial intelligence and pattern analysis, as uh, you, you mentioned. Um, very often, when the attack is very sophisticated, you actually don't fight someone. You fight uh, another artificial intelligence that is changing its pattern and its behavior on the fly. And the only way you can uh, protect this is to have the same tools. And so we spend a lot of time in, in uh, pattern behavioral, you know, behavioral analysis using pattern recognition machine learning techniques that are uh, changing themselves um, based on the change of the uh, attack surface or the attack behavior or the attack uh, strategy on the other side. Um, and, and in fact, you may not know this, but um, most of the things that happen today are not, it's not someone. It's um, or the most sophisticated one, at least. Um, you are, we are already in the machine-to-machine -machine defense. Um, and uh, the analyst, the human analyst, is very important to uh, make this algorithm evolve. But in many ways, they evolve by themselves. We don't even know. We don't even understand how they do it, how the, our algorithm change in front of the uh, other side's change. Um, this is why we call this artificial intelligence, obviously. Um, uh, but these this are the... The, the area of research that we spend a lot of time on is making the defense move at the same time as we see the attack move um, in every respect to the point where we let the machine do its own thing um, uh, and trust in a way, which is weird to say, but trust in a way the artificial intelligence is able to change as fast as the other guy. That's helpful. Um, so Najam, how do we build a platform that allows a sort of layer defense. There's no cookie cutter for every customer, every network, but do you have a notion of a model or a technology spectrum that will work? Um, there are a number of things you have to do um, to build a defense model that is sustainable and learning over time. Um, one of the things that we found was that um, no single platform or solution that you could buy from the industry would scale uh, or be able to span the horizon that, that we cover or we wanted to cover. So we ended up uh, building a lot of our systems internally. Um, and the key principle there is that um, we're building se security capabilities across the board in pretty much the entire layer of the infrastructure stack and, and all the way up to the application itself. But not just that, but the other thing that um, we're really focus on is that security is part of the entire fabric of Facebook rather than security being a layer that a team uh, implements in certain ways. Um, so a very simple human example of uh, the first day you come into Facebook and you join as an employee, 
Um, this will be really grilled into you. And even simple things like, hey, if you don't have any need to touch user data, do not go near the user data. If you touch user data and you didn't need to, you'll be walked out before your feet even touch the ground. This is a first day of orientation with a new employee coming in and getting that message. It's pretty shocking for people saying, oh my, I just joined the company instead of saying welcome. They say, <laughs> do not go near the data, otherwise you'll be walked out in a minute. Um, but that just sort of gets the message across in terms of how we think about security. Um, it shouldn't be that security came in and said, hey, this is our policy, implement that. Uh, everybody's involved. So every software system we're building, we're building capabilities in that that we have detection capabilities to be able to collect data and, and, and essentially be able to analyze it. Um, we'll do simple things like uh, we're talking about uh, what an employee might click on. So we run these campaigns called Hacktobers. And um, there's a team just comes up with very creative phishing lures to get you to click on stuff. And uh, employees sort of compete on who can identify the most Hacktobers. Uh, when you get an email from Mark saying, hey, I am, or Mark's admin saying, hey, we're doing this new series about running lunch uh, with Mark, so you're invited click here to, to sign up. Would you click? Now this is your CEO saying, hey, I'm running a new group call, uh, to have lunch with employees. Most people would be like, yeah, click, let's do this. Uh, oops. Um, so there, there's, there are things that you, you have to do that are just not obvious. It may not be technology, but it's making security as part of your normal everyday routine. So every system you're building is starts out with the security architecture that makes sense. Rather than you built a system and then you're going and saying, oh, okay, how do I secure this thing? Um, that invariably ends up in the wrong, wrong space. Um, so I can sort of go on to the list of things that we ended up doing. The, the, the trouble that we do have with this model is that um, we find it hard to, f uh, to f uh, find solutions from the industry that we can buy. They tend to be very narrow. Uh, very specific and doesn't scale. The other thing that uh, for us in terms of response of a security incident is that we want to be able to detect and mitigate very quickly. And when I say very, very quickly, we're talking within seconds. Uh, and anything you want to do in seconds, you can't have a human involved. So you have to figure out how you're going to detect in software and be able to mitigate it. Uh, and at times, mitigation requires you're taking devices offline, quarantine them. So you have to build platforms or uh, ability to actually detect in software and mitigate and take a platform completely offline without a human getting involved. Right. And so for that, you end up essentially building your own systems mm -hmm. that know the infrastructure really, really well. Yeah, it's an interesting time. I mean, Leo, the days of going to uh, your favorite vendor, you know, Cisco or HP, a one-stop shop and just buying a security solution or over. What are your thoughts on that? This the, the architecture that's needed and building a layer defense, you know, building a platform uh, versus you know buying uh, boxes that quote unquote secure the network. Yeah, I think that's a great point. It's getting very expensive to buy all these tools and manage them and maintain the headcount necessary to uh, keep them running. Um, so I think it's useful to look at um, what it what it what the adversary requires to do to do their job. And two of the things that you see common in every attack and um, I haven't found one that doesn't have these two components, is, is, is the abuse of user credentials and the um, what we call lateral movement. That is moving from a lesser protected segment of the network to a sensitive part of the network. Um, and when you think about those two components of an attack, denying those uh, is transferring complexity and difficulty and expense to the adversary. And, um, better protecting yourself. So we are uh, very focused on software-defined perimeter as a way to prevent those two steps. Um, in the first part, uh, software-defined perimeter as a, as a uh, specification, as an architecture, requires very robust uh, authentication of the user, meaning not just username and password, not just even multi-factor, but context. And I think you're going to see more context being used to determine who is on the other end of the communication. It's not just um, uh, packets that tell us uh, whether that person has the username and the password, but where that person is, what type of device that person is using, the time of day, and all the things that should make a user 
more credible uh, when presenting themselves to be uh, privileged to a part of your network. So first part of software-defined perimeter, I think, in authenticating the user is very, very important. The second part is the ability to create micro-segments, and that is a, a trend that we really have to focus on. It's sort of going back to the basics. You only give someone access to a part of the network that they need access to, and what we have in the present architecture is on a VLAN, once I have access to one resource on the VLAN, I, I theoretically, and, and in most cases, can send packets to everything else on, the, on that segment. And as a result, I can explore um, other resources for vulnerabilities and eventually find one and escalate. So the ability to uh, micro-segment, the ability to authenticate users robustly, and uh, to do that with policy-driven uh, automated engines rather than with uh, traditional human-managed firewall rules, I think, is, is really uh, the way uh, forward. Uh, we've, we've focused on software-defined perimeter. We think that's a way to go as an architecture. We've, we are deploying software-defined perimeter in our own environment, which has reduced some cost and complexity uh, on our side. Uh, and uh, we think that um, in terms of investment, uh, going forward by reducing headcount, we're not only getting uh, security benefit on the front end by making our network invisible, but um, we're also reducing the number of people it takes to manage this network. So uh, there are some platforms out there, but I think, like you said, it's a, it's a basic change in how we architect. Instead of trying to use firewalls, VPNs, NACs, and other hard-to-manage legacy uh, technologies, if you think about it, the stateful firewall uh, was introduced in 1994. Uh, forward almost 20 years, we're still trying to contort this tool to do what we needed to do in cloud and hybrid environments. So, uh, we need some native cloud tools um, and change in, changes in architecture, and uh, I think software-defined perimeter for us anyway in terms of deploying it internally is a platform that we find very promising. Thanks. That was helpful. Uh, George, what, what technologies are you applying to the security challenge in your network or at the application level? Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, the, the network that we deliver to our customers is uh, it's, it's managed Ethernet. It's generally a layer two. Um, so it's private to a point. The thing is that generally we're going through multiple network providers. So that's the challenge there is you really need to know how your data is getting from point A to point B because the weakest link is, is going to be, you know, one device maybe in a little, a little uh, remote community uh, telco mm -hmm. that, uh, that is, you know, part of your path. Um, so you really need to, uh, you know, ask those questions. You know, we talked a lot about trust, trust your partners. Um, I think you need to earn that trust. So until you uh, truly understand, you know, the technology behind the services that, um, that we're buying as part of our solution um, and the practices are secure, um, you know, you really have to ask those tough questions. Um, and a lot of it does come down to practices and processes as well. It's not just the technology. Um, I mean, technology is changing so quickly. The devices that are out there in the network, you know, there's constant updates and patches, and it's very easy to deploy a solution and forget about it for a while until there's a problem. Then you go back and say, oh, yeah, well, that, that software is, you know, two years old. Um, so it's really important that, um, that you have really tight um, processes on, on managing your infrastructure um, and keeping them up to date. Great. Thank you. Laurent, uh, I look at the uh, cybersecurity market maps. I think you've seen the same, and there are thousands of vendors. And you're looking at that chart, and you're wondering, how do all these pieces fit together? What's your perspective on the, the landscape, or the vendor landscape, and where you fit? But how, you know, how does someone rationalize all these different applications and solutions? And talk about gateways and VPNs and firewalls to put together a complete picture. Well, they don't. That's the problem. Mm -hmm. And so uh, one thing, uh, so I, I know I'm on the other side, but do not trust your supplier. <laughs> right? Do not trust your vendor because he's going to say, oh, we take care of everything, don't worry about it. And, and, and then you find out, oh, but the perimeter is actually not what I thought it would be. And, and uh, it's a nightmare when that happens, and we see this sometimes. Do not trust your vendor. Understand what they do and, and the perimeter of what they do. Another thing, um, and my, my colleagues say that very well uh, in software defined or uh, networks or even in username and password, uh, use what I call orthogonal defense. Orthogonal means that they are independent from one to the other. So it's a very good example with the username and password. Well, the context of what this user is doing has nothing to do with the knowledge of the password of that person. And so if you have a context analysis, 
or behavior analysis that is independent from the knowledge of oh, this guy has a right password, therefore he should be able to do anything he wants, then this orthogonality, so this independence between layers is what I think works because you, you, it's very hard to crack. You crack one layer, you will not crack the other one because the other one has nothing to do with the previous. So orthogonalities of defense, uh, behavior-based analytic has nothing to do with an attack payload. You, you may have an attack payload uh, that you will detect it there. It's kind of the antivirus, but for applications and networks, more sophisticated, I guess. Um, uh, but the behavior to get there is also what matters. And you catch him or you catch the guy uh, whether there's an attack payload or whether there is a behavior or, or by this combination of these two things that is really weird, this behavior I have never seen from this user, even though I know who this user is very well. Uh, one example we have is um, a very large bank uh, in North America. And they have usernames and passwords. They have customers looking at their accounts. And they have these uh, 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 two-factor authentications. They know this user. This user has been a customer for 10 years, therefore he should access his account, no problem. Uh, but then you find out, oh well, his desktop was compromised and it's not him uh, moving the mouse, it's actually someone else. And how do you identify this is, well, it's a, a very orthogonal way of doing it is, is his port open? You know, uh, are there other ports than port 80 and 443 open on his machine? And if that's the case, then there is a higher degree of probability that he may be compromised, therefore, I will increase my risk awareness for these users even though I know him for 10 years. It's because of this orthogonal independent layer that you add on top of each other. Now, nobody has a clear way, and I'll stop here. Nobody has a clear way of, yeah, but uh, am I protecting all my perimeters? And is there anything else open? Well, we don't know. That's why you cannot trust your vendor. You have to do this exercise yourself. But by adding independent layer on top of each other is usually a good practice. That's very helpful. Um, so I, we only have a few minutes left, but I would like to talk about, I think, what one of the biggest problems is in the industry, which is complacency. It, it's amazing to think that despite being in the newspaper headlines and the news headlines every day, with breaches and attacks, there seems to be this almost acceptance of as, as the new norm, particularly with th within the executive suite or the boardroom. You don't, you don't really see many CEOs being fired for a data breach, despite you know massive implications. You know, what's your, what's your thought about engaging leadership, management, the board, the CEO in these discussions, and how to, how to really get them more aware and involved uh, to the side of the business, typically something they know, f you know fairly little about? I'll take an easy shot. Mark, easy Mark, Mark shot. Zuckerberg not, not uh, included. <laughs> yeah, Zuck, Zuck is very much into security. Yeah. Uh, but to me, it's a, the easy way is to, uh, especially people who run security, is go hire a red team and mm -hmm. have them attack your infrastructure, try to, to hack in. Mm -hmm. And when they do, um, show the data to your CEO, and if it doesn't freak that out or them out, then you've got a problem. But yeah. most of the time, that's all it takes um, to get people to really the message. Look, I've got all your user data here on a server outside your infrastructure, and that's all it takes. So you really need that wake-up call. Um, Leo, what does it take as an advisor working for CEOs to really get them informed, educated, sort of on the right track as far as, you know, cybersecurity goes? Yeah, so it's hard to get um, CEOs and boards focused because security is not a core part of their business. It doesn't generate revenue in most cases. It uh, is a cost factor. It, if not implemented properly, it can uh, impact operations negatively. So. It's not something people want to do a lot of, uh, naturally. Um, what I think is changing is that boards and CEOs are responding to the consumer, whether they are business to business or business to consumer. More customers are becoming security aware and demanding security. So if you look at something like uh, Department of Financial Services, uh, cyber regulations that are issued, it's all about who you're doing business with should have certain security measures in place. And until the market, in effect, uh, demands uh, this type of uh, quality in the service, meaning a security component, uh, there's, there's always going to be an eye towards making cuts and making uh, and minimizing security. So I think what's changing, and it's a positive thing, is that both individual consumers and businesses are demanding of their vendors more security in the products. And security is becoming more of a differentiator for some vendors, for most vendors. And as a result, the CEOs and boards will naturally, from a business case, focus on security. So 
as a security professional, you can talk till you're blue in the face and, 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 and demand security and eventually wear out your welcome and be walked out the door. Uh, no, there's nothing more powerful than having the customer demand security. And I think that's the mindset that's changing and that's what's going to change the attitude in the board, uh, in the boardroom and at the, in the C-suites. George, obviously it comes down company to company, but what does your company think in terms of the importance of security in your plan? Yeah, I, I mean, definitely, our, I know our CEO is really big on security. It's a differentiator for our, our solution, and so we practice that internally as well. And I think the key really is, is to understand at the senior levels that security is not just an IT issue. It's an organizational issue that the whole organization has to, has to rally behind. They have to understand the impact of a breach to the whole organization, not just lost data, but lost revenue, lost customers, you know, brand damage. You know, for um, you know, every dollar that you put into being proactive, um, you spend fourteen dollars in, in uh, you know being reactive and, and trying to, to fix uh, fix the problem. Um, so that's the challenge. But at the end of the day, you know, it always comes down to you've got your IT budget, and uh, it's always a certain percentage of your revenue, and it's it's a challenge. It's a challenge. But like you said, when, until there's a wake up call. Um, uh, you know things don't uh, don't change, but I know within our organization we uh, we take we take it very seriously. Good, it's good to hear. We get the support. And yeah, Lorraine, what about you? I mean, you're obviously selling to the CSO, to the CIO, but do you have conversations with executive leaders? Uh, yeah, as we, a vendor? we we do have uh, okay. this kind of conversation. Usually, the chief security officer is a good a good contact for us. Some companies don't have one. Yeah. This is weird. Um, okay, so uh, uh, th there's two kind of customers. There's a, one I call the security by design. So that's the Facebook of the world and my colleagues as well, where they understand anything they do has to be secured and it's, it's built in when they are doing it, right? Um, and then there are all the others. And for all the others, our best friend is the Wall Street Journal, really, <laughs> is the news. Uh, well, you know, guess what happened to Target? Yeah, it could happen to you guys. What do you think about it? And then um, and, uh, the last point I have is security does not have to be expensive. It's really funny how people think about this. It doesn't have to cost money that much. Um, it's, it's a few percentage on your, on your IT budget. It doesn't need to be more than this. Uh, we are building, uh, we see trends of building product, not just us, where security products are actually simple to use. Yeah, uh, it used to be uh, that security are, uh, you know, we just sell complexity. Oh, because it's a complex problem, it's an important problem, therefore it's so complex, you have to do all of these things that are very, very expensive. It's not the case anymore. Security, you know, we, sell, we simplify the function. Uh, we sell to companies who do not have a security practice. They have a CISO, they have the culture, but they don't have the 200 people team that Bank of America has. Um, security doesn't have to be expensive. Um, and, and again, the, the, the Wall Street Journal is a best friend. <laughs> well, thank, thanks so much, panel. Really great panel and amazing insights. <laughs> it's really rare to get so much uh, experience right here on, on one stage. So thanks again.